So what's going to do? Oh yes, that's right. So this is this deals with physical mediumship. Really, it was the Skoll experiment that was done in the nineties. In a little town called Skoll, which is near Dis in Norfolk, and it's in my view one of the most successful paranormal experiments or in terms of physical mediumship ever conducted. It was massively. It took five years over a five year period. A group, a very small group of mediums and researchers would be in this basement in the house. Every week they'd get together. Now, physical mediumship requires dedication. Yeah. yeah. You've got to sit, like, you know, just sit there and nothing will happen. Nothing happened for a year. A year. Have you seen our Joshua Tree one? No. Well, we've got to show you our Joshua Tree. <laughs> watch our Joshua Tree haunted house film. Right. Lots of shit went on there. Sorry. Okay. Let's, so, anyway, so, that's, so, so <laughs> yeah, it, it, it has to have a sort of combination of the right elements yeah. for it to work. Yeah. And of course, you've got to have that bunch up there cooperating. Yeah. And so what they, why they were so successful, I think, is partially because the spirit team, is what they refer to them, was actually dedicated to providing physical evidence, evidence. for life after death. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of what the Skull Experiment is all about. So, and when you, you study physical mediumship, you have this thing called matter through matter. So you can have the materialization of spirit forms in solid form. So for instance, in the Skull Experiment, they had like hands sort of floating around the seance room, touching people. So you could actually shake the hand of a deceased person and what was so interesting was that the hand just felt like an, exactly like a normal human yeah. hand, so it was warm to the touch, yeah. you know, um, it's like a mannequin or anything, it was actually sort of a living hand. And the, they were asked, you know, why just a hand? And they said, well, it's really, really hard to produce the whole body, mm-hmm. it's a huge amount of energy required to do yeah. that. So it's just much easier, we have a little hand floating around. Yeah. Now, you find, so that's really where you're getting it, sort of the, the, the spiritual, which is in a sense just a non-physical world. Yeah. Becoming physical in some way that I don't fully understand. I feel um, when my grandmother's around, I know she's around. I mean, I do a bit of mediumship anyway, so it's probably not what everyone would experience all the time. But when she's around, I always feel her stroking my head or touching my face. And it's exactly as you described. It's really physical. I feel like a cheek being cupped. It's really lovely. It's really odd that. I mean, with, with, with more conventional forms of physical mediumship, you have ectoplasm. And that's always been highly controversial, again, because the subject gets polluted with fakers, right? Mm. But genuine physical mediums, who I might add, are extremely rare. Yeah. There's only a handful the pro- of The proper ones. trance mediums that you get, where the, yeah, they where, embody the spirit. Where, well, you know, yeah. where you get ectoplasmic forms yeah. occurring, yeah. Like, which actually comes out of the medium's yeah. body yeah. and then forms into shapes. Yeah. For the spirits wow. to take on. Yeah. That's very rare indeed. There's a guy called Stuart Alexander who's mm. up north in Hull and he does seances. But the problem as a filmmaker is that they won't allow you in to film it. Mm. And they all occur in total darkness. Yeah. Usually. Yeah. Um, so everyone says, first of all, oh, that's because they're faking it. They just, you know. But it's mm. not. It's because yeah. the, the, the conditions that are required. It's about the vibration. Yeah, it's, it's all yeah. that stuff. The, the, there yeah. are very specific conditions in order yeah. for this thing to take yeah. place. And light is not, is completely an anathema to, yeah. to those kind of phenomena. So that's just the way it is. Yeah. So it's a problem with the, you know because I think physical mediumship is some of the best evidence for life after death so yeah. some of the most dramatic but virtually impossible to film mm. I have an amazing um, friend Anne Scholes we must see if we can film her doing probably not ectoplasm but she does do physical mediumship really? she has a guide uh, called Ming and he's a Chinese philosopher and he's amazing like now Anne is like Manchester northern you know larger than life hilarious lady and when Ming comes in, she completely changes. It's almost like her whole face changes. You can see the features are transfigured mm. completely. Mm. Um, the arms go in the sleeves. And the questions that you ask Ming, it's not so much of a personal nature, it's of a larger philosophical nature. So questions about the future of the world, what's going to happen. Um, mm. Last time, I mean, it was years ago that she showed me last, but... When he came in, it was a completely different form of mediumship to what she normally does, because she normally like sort of describe what she's seeing, whatever. But she went, she doesn't even know really what he's saying when he comes through. The body's mm. like taken over, mm. and um, but he's really he's really like high level master kind of thing. I mean, it's it's really really cool to see. Yeah, because that's yeah. the good. That's a very important point because like you know it depends entirely who you're communicating with. Yeah. yeah. People just sort of assume that once they're talking to somebody in the afterlife, it's going to be sort of. Yeah. you know, of, of, of value. Yeah. I must admit, I, I have to say that with the Skull Experiment, because they had like a thousand hours of recorded communication with right. the other side, and I, didn't get, I, didn't, I wasn't given a thousand hours, but I was given quite a lot of it, and I thought a lot of it was quite mundane. Right. Which struck me as like, I mean, a lot of the sitters, you know, the people in the sales, 
would um, would just ask these really silly questions. And I, you know, if I had the opportunity to do that, I'd be like, you know, <laughs> does God exist? You know, what I mean, sort of like, you know, let's let's get to the yeah. nitty gritty, shall we? And a lot yeah. of them are just sort of really quite mundane. But anyway, that's human nature, isn't it? Yeah. So. Yeah. And again, I think it's just proving beyond any reasonable, reasonable doubt doubts. Yes. that there is an afterlife. something out there. There is an afterlife. I mean, that's... Absolutely. I, I, there's yeah. no, to me, there's no doubt about it yeah. mm. in terms of just looking at the evidence. And I would say that, you know, and I'm, I've been brought up as a, you know, to, to question and be sceptical because I was a trained journalist. And so, you know, I'd look at things with a sceptical eye. Yeah. And, you know, I'd, I'd say now, I think, looked at that subject for a good old 10 years at least, you know, I'd, I'd say, well, I'm, that, you know, I'm 99% certain that yeah. the afterlife exists, but I always close that 1% just in case. Yeah. It's always healthy to question on of some course. level, isn't it? I mean, yeah, absolutely. Like, you know, like Laurie always says, we need evidence. And however that evidence comes for you, mm. everyone has a different level of evidence that they need. Like, yeah, exactly. for me, I have, like, my evidence can be very spiritual based because to me, the experiences are very physical. So it's a personal, physical, like, experience. I have almost enough evidence of mm. what's going on for myself. Yeah. Um, and then I'm always shown a sign in the physical world afterwards that right. what I've seen or experienced has actually happened. Yeah. Exactly. But a lot of people yeah. need it to be logical evidence, that they yeah. need it to be something right in front of their Tangible. face like they need the ectoplasm mm. to come out of the person mm. and they need to see mm. it with their own eyes mm. yeah. um but even, when, if, you know, even if they sometimes even if they see it they won't believe it you know? exactly so it's just, yeah. it depends entirely on the mindset of the individual because yeah, i mean having shown this film you know a million times to a million different bunch of people you get a very wide range of responses yeah. Yeah. some are very fearful yeah. yeah and some are like wow this is the best thing since sliced it. bread you know and and some uh, you know repeatedly was despite the, the, the level of evidence in the film which to me is very hard People just say, absolutely no way. Yeah, absolutely. I've done um, table tipping where they've actually had, I think we spoke about this in another episode, where you've actually got everyone with a, a fingertip very lightly on a little table and you call spirit in and they get the table to move and to dance. You play music and get the table moving. It's a bit like a, mm -hmm. a seance, but mm -hmm. with the party yeah. involved. So, so in this film, uh, we interviewed a guy called Marcello Barci, who was in Italy. He was famous... Uh, for being able to communicate with the deceased via radio. Yeah. This is so this is this is whole area of what's called instrumental transcommunication. Is this... Yeah. Okay. So White Noise. You've probably seen this movie, which um, was a big Hollywood blockbuster with Michael Keaton. Uh, it's a sort of horror film, basically, but you know, it's quite good. And but if you buy the DVD, there's DVD extras, and they're really interesting um, because it's the the butlers who were researchers in America who were taken around and did EVP, they're, they're EVP specialists, yeah. electronic voice phenomena EVP. Um, anyway, we did some of the, the, the DVD extras in there. Yeah. <coughs> but it's in the afterlife investigations as well, isn't it? Yeah, that's true. There's a whole piece on... There's, on there's, a, and there's, a, yeah, there's a whole section on Marcello Barci, Marcello. Um, which is really interesting because, I mean, just to sort of give you a little story, we went down there and he's got a sort of special place in Grosseto uh, where people come from around the world, usually grieving it's parents. Here, yeah. yeah, grieving parents who've lost their kids. And there's like pictures on the walls there of like loads of loads of kids who have, um, which the parents have brought in the hope of hearing the voice of their deceased child. Mm. And I think there's nothing worse than losing a child, yeah. right? So there's a degree to which they get trying to get solace. And we interviewed a number of mothers who'd actually, you know, received, you know, they, they had heard the voice of their child. And we've got, mm. we have that in the film where it actually comes through, um, which is just absolutely mind-blowing. Yeah. You know? And, and, and wow. the thing is that they get, you know, they're at the point of despair, but when their child speaks to them from the afterlife, you know, they, they, it just gives them the whole they're hope. You know, they, and it's, yeah. and it's like, really discernible. Yeah. So it, it's, it's not, you know, you, you can you hear... Can the, the, they're clear voices saying, look, it's me, voices. it's Marco, I'm here. Yeah. You know, something like that. And it's there, and, you know, they recognise things. And they recognise it. And not only that, but we... Not we, but the, we feature in the film the analysis of some of these voices. Wow. So in one case, uh, this young girl, about 18, she got killed in a car accident. Now, what we had is the recordings of her voice when she was alive, plus the recording of the voice that came through the radio when she was deceased, which the father recognised because he was there, right? Wow. And you, using 
uh, FBI endorsed software where you can analyze a voice pattern because a voice pattern is like a fingerprint, they're yeah. unique, yeah. Yeah. all completely unique. And so you can determine whether these two are a match. You're a match, and there was a wow. 97% match. That's just bonkers yeah. evidence, isn't That's it? That's fantastic evidence. Yeah. Fantastic evidence. evidence. Yeah. Wow. So. Yeah. And I mean, it was so moving for the parents oh. to know yeah. that it, it really is. is. Yeah. 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 It really is. And there's another one, this woman who is in the States who lost her child in a boating accident and continued to try and communicate with him through EVP, electronic voice phenomenon, where you use a tape recorder to kind of record little snippets. Yeah. And she got tons of stuff from that. When she had it, and she has. And she was so empowered by this because it gives her an ongoing relationship with her deceased child. Yeah. And yeah. she knows that, that he's continuing in another dimension. Wow. Yeah. And so it just really makes you know, her life so much yeah, easier. Absolutely. And I mean, this, we've had experiences. and We've I've had it on it, this show, haven't we? we? We've had it on the show. <laughs> we have had some sounds coming in, but I had an extraordinary. Yeah, yeah. What, while you're recording? Yeah. And someone went, boom! boom. On, uh, on camera on one of yeah. our episodes. I can't yeah. remember which episode it was. It was a while back, wasn't it? <laughs> really audible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really audible. great. But I lost a friend uh, quite a few years ago. <gasps> yeah, this is amazing. And, amazing. And it was, yeah, it, you know, I'm very philosophical about death, but, you know, when someone's 35 years old and, mm. you know, it's just... Mm. It's, no, tough. It, it's tough. Anyway, so I've been very conscious and very aware of him kind of being around and if ever I've been around anybody that is psychic they was like oh who's this guy so you know I, I know he's around and I was he having... bought her shoe made me buy her shoes for her birthday yeah, like so... I mean it was ridiculous yeah he does he does yeah. turn up but well, I was having after a... he died that was a community yeah, yeah, I, I never yeah. met him I when see. he was alive yeah. but he comes oh, right. through a lot yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah he comes through That's a lot considerate of him he yeah. is I know he's but a I was... bit annoying at times <laughs> <laughs> he's not in Dublin <laughs> and he was a very very lovely very considerate very caring person I have to say and he would always be there for, for mm. you know for everyone, me particularly and I was having a bit of a bad day and I you know some stuff had gone on I was feeling a bit emotional my phone was in my bag and my phone was you know it was switched off the lock was on it yeah. in my handbag and at a certain point I went to get my phone to check something and when I, when I turned my phone on, the text box was, it, it, it was as though I had been writing a text. It was as though, or almost like a button had been hit. So you know when, if you, if you hit a, the, the, the kind of texting thing and it just creates a gibberish mm -hmm. message, you know if you've accidentally mm -hmm. hit it and mm -hmm. your finger, it would just create. Mm. Anyway, so there was this huge, great big long message. Mm. And when I scrolled through it, I mean, I literally had... It was right at the bottom, wasn't it? No, no, no. It was literally embedded right the way through. It was kind of... Nick. Nicholas. And then his email address. Yeah, popped up. Really? Right? His full email address. And then... This is a deceased person. Yeah. And then vulnerable, vulnerable. Uh, it's okay, it's okay, be fine. Interspersed in between all of this gibberish. Now, the thing is, my logical mind went, eh, maybe something, you know, maybe... Th when was the last time you used his email address, though? Like, but I hadn't. That that's phone, the thing. I hadn't used that, and it was his work email address as well. It wasn't even an email address that he and I would have corresponded through. It was his work one, but his name was quite distinctive, I'm not going to say it, but it was very distinctive. So there would have been nobody else with that name. Mm. And, I mean, it's still hurting my head to this day. So mm. in my mind, there's absolutely no other explanation for it than that was him communicating with me. And the thing mm. with him as well was that when I first met him, he was very much involved in the corporate world and quite straight. <laughs> and we met through NLP. And then I had him, you know, doing all sorts of weird and wonderful stuff. And by the time we got to the end of it, he was exploring all kinds of psychic stuff. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. he had a PhD in... Um, in, well, it was, uh, I always call it atmospheric, stratospheric something or other. It was to do with clouds mm, and energy mm, and, and, and mm -hmm, vibrations. Mm. And it's like, if anybody, the way his brain worked, he was almost too smart. He was, you know, he was mm. almost on genius level. If anybody was going to work out how to use technology to get in touch, it was going to be him. Yeah. And there have been, there've been other things along it's not the way. That, it's not that complicated, though. I mean, you get, EVP shows that you can use a simple tape recorder. Yeah. And people often use these digital recorders now. Yeah. 
these IC recorders, and uh, you know that's it. If you're just if you're kind of persistent, yeah, and record at the same time, and your intentions are sort of clear, yeah, you know, you're going to get results. You yeah. can get results. Absolutely. You know? I need so, to record more because I hear I hear like when we were going to Egypt. Remember I said the hand dryer in the bathroom started talking to me. <laughs> it's like whispering at me and telling me stuff about Egypt. I can't yeah, remember what it was. Yeah, you should have recorded should have that. Should have recorded it. Really to see if that would come through. If it would through. actually come through. I think, I mean, the thing is that, I think that, that, yeah. that what's happening is that the spirits are, you, they're trying to come in in many different ways. Yeah. You know, there's, there's this desire for communication. So I think, yeah. especially when you're sort of, new in the afterlife you just died yeah and there's a lot of emotional connection still with the living then they want to communicate yeah and there's it's difficult because yeah. you know it's actually it's actually quite complicated doing that so i mean yeah with, with the skull experiment for instance they it advanced so the uh it went from sort of like the mediums well the mediums were going to trance and then voices would come out through the larynx, they use the larynx of the, yeah the which we've yeah. done yeah. okay right so you know how that works and that can be very odd. Yes. So you can get male or female voices coming out and different personalities anyway. So, yeah. And so you have a two-way conversation with a deceased person, just like you and I are talking yeah. now, right? Then it went, it went to what's called direct voice, where the voices actually just come out of thin air. Yeah. They're not using the larynx anymore. Right, that's amazing. And it was interesting because there was a guy called Walter Schnippner. Schnippner. He, was a, he was a German engineer who was attending the sales. And he said to the spirit, how do you do that? Because if you don't have a larynx... Yeah. By the way, if there's anyone around and you want to do <laughs> yeah. audible speaking while we're filming... <laughs> it come through on the it. phone. Yeah. Come through on the come phone. Through. Yeah, exactly. Because I can feel energies around. Mm. I keep feeling like someone wants to kind of come through. I'm sure through. they do. It's, when you you start, can feel the energy of the room when, shift. Yeah, when you yeah. discuss these things, that's something. Yeah, yeah they, they zoom in. But yeah, so anyway, Schnitko, he said, um, how do you do it? And the voice, he basically said, I don't know how to do it. What I do is I think right. the thoughts... Yeah. And somehow they're translated into your domain and they're yeah. turned into physical uh, yeah. vibrations of the air. But he didn't know. He said there was a sort of mechanism that was doing it for him. Yes. Which is quite interesting. So yeah. it's sort of like, you know, and also when you get the EVP bunch, you hear like, you get visual EVP where images are appearing on television screens, yeah. right? Uh, computer screens and things like that. And, you know, of, often they show sort of images of the afterlife, which yeah. is a really bizarre, you know. And, the, and again, so what's going on? How is, so to me, it's like, a form of psychokinesis. Psychokinesis yeah. from the deceased. Yeah. Yeah. So they're physically altering the, 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 the physical energy. world. Yeah. yeah. They're interfering, but we don't quite know how because we don't know what PK. Yeah. PK is just a label. We don't yeah. understand. And obviously, how it works. sound and light. Yeah. You know those frequencies, the technology that we but have now. But bearing witness as well. Yeah. Like it depends on how clear the channel. Yeah. Mm. So if someone like the way I know how it works in terms of like mediumship training and um, channeling training that I've done mm. is that the person that's witnessing it is the key. So if you are really clairaudient and you yeah. can actually audibly hear spirit when you experience them, then that will translate. You're, you're like the door for that voice to come through audibly. Like I don't hear mm. clairaudiently audibly. I hear it as thought, like thoughts in my own head. The only time I've heard it audibly is when I've been asleep and I'll hear Alex. That's usually my cousin Thomas. Um, it's very shouty, <laughs> like it like, likes mm. to be excited mm. yeah. comes through. Yeah, and I've heard but if you're very visual, clairvoyant, then that's where, like, the guy taking the photographs, that's where it usually yeah. will come through. Like, mm -hmm. when Laurie and I were in Lewis, we both took photos of the same thing, but because I'm really visually clear, the face turned up really clear on mine. Laurie's turned up as an orb, but you can see the face in the orb when you mm -hmm. zoom in on it. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the window through which we are yeah. bearing witness, and scientists have talked about this yeah. now with the quantum physics stuff, like light particles change depending on if they're being observed or not mm -hmm. so it's the observer so it's 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 a two-way interface between the the channel and the spirit that holds the energy mm -hmm. so you're holding energy like i know it, my grandmother is in spirit and we do a lot of work together helping souls pass over and pass back she's like a, so she came through to me and told me she's a soul midwife oh. and my mum after this happened my mum inherited a clock that my grandmother used to own and at first, mum thought the clock was broken because the clock goes off at all these unruly hours, like it bombs mm. all the time. Mm. And this is at home in Australia. But what we figured out is that the clock only chimes when someone is about to die oh, or be born. It's a, it strange. chimes the doorway opening, and it's my grandmother's clock. And she's told me, she's shown me, I actually helped um, in an intensive care unit, I helped a man pass over who was in a coma a lot 
last year or the year before and I was present and my grandmother was present with me. She was so there with me. Right. And she was like, I'm, I'm on the other side, you know, basically yeah, yeah. pass this yeah. soul through. Yeah. yeah. So whenever one of our relatives is about to die, the clock goes, or whenever someone's about to be born, oh, the right. clock goes. And mum yeah. rings me going, oh, the clock's chiming again. Who's going this time? <laughs> and always there's either someone yeah. coming through or leaving. And it's yeah. like, really, we had a whole quick succession of like my great aunt leaving and, you know, different people leaving at one time. So it's there's amazing. There's a lot of people leaving and going, aren't there? I mean, yeah. You know, every, every second, two, two, two three people die. Yeah, it's of people that are particularly <clears throat> people that known, are, to yeah, them. known to us in our family. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Sure. And of course, did I tell you about the, the, the telephone call that we had? You did. Yeah, so years ago when my grandmother died and we were all back in Ireland for the funeral and at about five, six o'clock in the morning, the morning of the funeral, the phone rang and my sister answered it. She was the nearest one to the phone. And I remember hearing her having a, a very weird conversation saying, who is it? And you want me to tell him what? And is he going to know? And well, no, you can't speak to him because it's, you know, everyone's asleep. And, uh, and, and just almost being qu quite sort of curt with this person and saying, but what? You want me to tell him what? Put the phone down. I said, who was that? And she went, Oh, it doesn't matter. Some, uh, somebody, but it doesn't matter. And when we got up in the morning and I reminded her of it, she said, do you know, it was someone really familiar, but almost that thing where it's on the tip of your tongue, she couldn't quite place mm -hmm. who it was. Right. So the message had been for my aunt's partner who didn't live with her in the house. So again, we were questioning, well, why was somebody calling for him mm. when he doesn't live there? And in Ireland, when someone dies, everybody mm. in the surrounding mm. area knows mm. that the death has mm. happened. So you'd never in a million years. And it was almost a work call. And I said, well, what was the message? And she said he told him to put the wood on the chimney. And when I questioned, what, you know, what does that mean? He'll know. Don't worry, he'll know. Mm. Just mm. tell him to put mm. the wood on the chimney. Mm. So my sister said to uh, you know, my aunt's partner, look, there was this really random phone call. Do you know what this means? He said, I've got no idea. And why would anybody be sending me that message here? So we were all a bit confused, but we parked the idea. And it obviously seemed like a work call, like a business work call. He's a builder and, you mm, know, mm. assumed it was linked to a job. So later that day, we all go off, we have the funeral. And I think it was actually the next day. Everything goes off all right. The next day, we go out and we go for a drive. And when we come back, we drive back to the house and there was a blue flame shooting out, out of the, the chimney. chimney. Uh -huh. And it was an old, you know, it's an old yep. sort of wood frame, but stone cottage mm -hmm. in the middle of nowhere. So we go running into the house and the chimney inside had obviously caught fire. And my sister, of course, you know, my, my mum's, everyone's panicking, I was running around chaotic. My sister's cabin crew. So she's mm -hmm. safety trained and mm -hmm. fire trained. Mm -hmm. So immediately, you know, goes into action, she's like, right, we need to block the oxygen off. So she goes in and she turns around suddenly to my aunt's partner and goes, put, the wood, to put the, the wood on the chimney. <laughs> oh shit. So he goes running off up to the top of the house. She gets something and covers the front of it. He's covering planks of wood on the top. And as he's doing that, and as they start putting the fire up, the fire brigade come flying down. The local, you know, they've obviously had phone calls to, to say people have seen the smoke. And they arrive and of course they pile up and as you know, they, they reach there mm. with him, they finally managed to, to put it out. They blocked the air, there's nothing to so you fuel think the, spirit, the fire. So think they started the fire? So the anyway, so they leave, oh, yeah. so we're, you know, we're all in shock, and we're all sat around, you know, having a drink, going, what was that? When suddenly my sister goes, oh my God. Mm. And my sister is not the sight issue. <laughs> my sister, she's open to stuff, much more open recently, which she's never been the one that would be that open to kind of, you know, psychic mm, mm, weird stuff. And mm. she went, I know who it was. And everybody went, what? Who was what? That phone call yesterday. It was granddad. It was granddad. And she'd been really close to him. And, but it was, again, it was almost like it had been veiled who yeah. it was. The awareness of who it had been hadn't been revealed until that moment in time. And then of course we were all hysterical because it, it absolutely categorically was him. It's exactly the kind of thing that he would do. And again, we'd had loads of other signals when he died that he had been in contact. So, yeah, phone calls, text messages. Yeah, anything. 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 Computers, fax machines. Yeah. 
The telephone calls from the dead are quite interesting. Though. Yeah. I mean, they're, but they're rare. I mean, they they're, are rare, but this again, is definitely my grandfather. There's, there's, there's another film that, we, that my partner, we, well, I started shooting because we were going to make three films about life after death. And the second one was about uh, instrumental transcommunication. Yeah. And that's, you can see it on the internet, it's called Call Heaven or Heaven Calling, one of the other films. Right. Yeah. Anyway, so that's um, directed by Dan Drayson and myself. And uh, in that, we have telephone calls from the dead. Yeah. Where basically uh, one of the famous ID, EDP United Sea researchers, <clears throat> Constantine Raudover, who was a Latvian philosopher and investigator, basically who died and then basically called up one of the other ITC researchers in Germany. And you, then you hear this conversation. Right. And he literally picks up the phone and it's Constantine wow. Raudover. <laughs> And he's got this. That's his Constantine around the bar. He's got this very clearly, you know, yeah. distinctive voice. Right. And they just have a little chat, you know. Um, so I mean, but they're they're rare, but they're they're spectacular yeah, when they actually they happen, are. you know. They are. So. I mean, so people have been trying to sort of like develop technologies. They're still trying to do it now, where you can get to sort of a reliable yeah. two-way conversation going via technology with the dead. But nobody so far has. I wonder if they've also it. done any, like, just while we're having the conversation, <clears throat> so the energy's really shifting in this room. My heart is going, I've got energy running into my, I just want to talk about the physiological effects that go on when spirit is around. There's like a, a heaviness that comes into the energy of the room and it almost feels like a squashing. I feel like there's people trying to come in and like, I don't do trans mediumship, so I'm, I say no, I'm like, mm. no, but mm. my ears, um, Feel like they're muffled and uh, it can feel like I'm like, going underwater and my heart's palpitating right so there's a lot of different energies in the room I wonder if they've done studies on like the physiological effects of what happens mm. when trance mediums are working or even when just mediums are working or when a portal is open or whatever yeah the energy like, comes because in, cause yeah, this room yeah. feels very full um, if you, if you go, I wonder if they can like make our light bulb blow or something like yeah, that. <laughs> do something gentle. Do something gentle that we can have some evidence. Here. Yeah, be good. There's a, I mean, because you know, I'm doing this. There's this a uh, series for Netflix that's just coming out, which you know, I'm the executive producer on. Friends of colleagues of mine are producing. Um, which is called Surviving Death. I think that's what the title. Yeah, I think it's based on a book, it, isn't it? It's Does based on Leslie. Know a Rodney, because I keep hearing Rodney. Whether in spirit or life, we'll just see if there's anyone. Ro- like it's, you know, it's like my Gary thing. Yeah. You know, random names shouted in my ear. Rodney. <laughs> I know if if anyone watching knows a Rodney, it's for you. <laughs> Sorry, carry right. on, Tim. <laughs> um, what was I saying? Oh, yeah, so basically, it was based around uh, Leslie Kane's uh, book called Surviving Death. And she was, she'd written a very amazing book on the UFO subject, <clears throat> which is a New York Times bestseller. This one is not a New York Times bestseller, but it's sold very well. Um, and anyway, so that the Netflix documentary, which will be six parts, will be a sort of really thorough investigation of kind of all the stuff we're doing. Although they won't, I don't think they want to do EVP. Which is a shame because I think that that is <clears throat> not so evidential EVP. Oh, and also, people think, think that it could be just PK. It could be the human you influencing the tape yeah. recorder. <clears throat> it's not. Yeah. But then, even that in and of itself is kind of yeah. Evidence it's, true, it's, it's evidence of psychic phenomena. It's evidence of the, of that. Well, yeah. PK is pretty well established anyway. Well, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Unless you're a complete idiot. Do you know anything about um, Raymond Moody's work and mm-hmm. his uh, shared, shared death experiences? Yeah, don't I don't know much about shared death experience. It's amazing. Yeah. Like where, um, and this is something that I've experienced as well, but I don't have any like tangible evidence like to share, but other than my experience of it. But where um, a person who is passing over. And where they talk about, you know, that they can see people in the room mm. and like, you know, my grandmother said, oh, they've all turned up for me. I yeah. think I'm in trouble. I think well. it's time to go. They're all here for me. But there have been these phenomena that Raymond talks about where you have shared death experience where someone who is absolutely alive and conscious and not about to die can see what the dying person is seeing in the room and experiences the, the portal opening and the, yeah, yeah. The, the family members turning yeah. up and, yeah, yeah, and yeah, all yeah. of that. I find that really fascinating yeah. that they've got evidence. Deathbed visions that often cause. Yeah, yeah, that well. they're seeing mm. what the dying person yeah. is seeing. Yeah. And, um, yeah, absolutely. You know, that, I just find that extraordinary. It is, and they're very common. Yeah, in, very yeah, common. In the medical profession yeah. you'll find the nurses who are attending people yeah. dying and stuff like yeah. that will frequently have these experiences. Yeah. yeah. It's, been, you know, it's, quite, quite ni- it's also quite nice that at that point of death, you know, where the sort of person can be really ill and suddenly sort of sit yeah, up and fall right, and, then rapture sort of, kind and they thing. see all yeah. their relatives coming in, you yeah. know, and then boom, they're dead. Yeah, yeah. yeah. My That's grandmother, 
it's quite it's quite nice that the fact that this transition to, to the other yeah, side definitely. is sort of you know softened by yeah. sort of by get all their faculties back as well my dad's yeah. a doctor and he talks about before people die they're often really well and you you almost get hope that they're going to survive like mm. they come back and they seem really well and yeah. get, they have the opportunity to almost say goodbye to everybody yeah. don't they before tie up their affairs yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah my grandmother was terrified of death she wasn't going to sleep towards mm. the end she was absolutely ter- raging. They'd literally almost have to pin her down in the bed to get her to sleep because she was, you know, She's running. So terrified of yeah, yeah, she's not waking up. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And then, as uh, obviously when it was getting closer, when when she would lie down, every now and again she would suddenly burst into this, you know, absolutely beatific smile, and, and uh, hands mm. were reaching mm. out, and, right, and she yeah. was saying, yeah. you know, Mama, Mama, and her mother had died when she was about Aww. three. And so when, as that started to happen, she started to be less fearful and then she would lie down and rest and then she, my mum would hear her having conversations with her auntie and all these different people, and different people at different times were coming in mm. and obviously my mum couldn't see anything mm. but she could, she could sense, she could mm. almost feel mm. these, these people coming in and same thing, as you said, when, you know, just before my grandmother was about to go, you know, this big, beautiful mm. smile came mm. on her face and it was almost a sense, you know, they're here mm. and I'm ready. And when she died, my mum said it was like literally all of the lines and all of the wrinkles, just, it literally just dropped away and it was like she was a young woman again mm. and looking excited about going off on yeah. this journey. So, Well, I must admit, I mean, I've, I say this to people, I mean, people who've, you know, recently bereaved, I'm like just a friend of mine's father just died recently and, I, and they don't have much of an understanding of this and I keep on saying to them you know well you don't really have anything to worry about you yeah know? I mean it's a loss for you place. of course but you know when you say that they just go mm, well, you just think that you know <laughs> and they get annoyed with you yeah and it's like you know if only you had understood what really happens at death yeah then it wouldn't be so traumatic for yeah. you and I think it would make things so much easier so much easier people. absolutely the solace for the bereaved and yeah. the, that's a lot of what this research I think is, yeah. is all about it and I think even in the work that we do as well I, I mean you know, I spend a lot of time doing you know regression work I spend a lot of time with death <laughs> a lot of people mm. taking people mm. to mm. death points mm. yeah. and then just giving them permission to at the point of death to float up and out of the body to see what happens and I don't think any of my clients when they've had that experience have any fear of death afterwards because they know really? that they leave they float up to that realm of the the, the spirit where there yeah. isn't any judgment where they just do get to do a review and they meet with all their loved ones and so it completely neutralizes the fear of death you know that there is a continuation you know that yeah. there is something else that's going I, mean, I don't think anyone in this room has a particular fear of death no. No. My, no fear, fear of my fear is getting old yeah being not Ill, doing everything and that being i'm supposed in pain to do and all that stuff you know which is quite natural <laughs> Right? Well, I don't well, think yeah, about I that. Don't, yeah. I don't think about that. I don't, I'm well. not afraid of death. I just don't want to go too soon. I quite yeah. like it here in the pleasure garden. I really? want to stay a bit longer. It's not always easy, <clears> but I, I like know, being I'm, alive. I've got too I'm much ready to, to go, do. Alex. I'm ready too to go. much to do here. No, yeah, right. so, yeah. You've got to. You've got I'm, way too I'm much done. to do. Too much no, to do. You I've got me, really so. weird energy going on here. I feel very floaty and not like I'm like like I'm not really in my body and I don't like it. I feel like there's someone trying to come in and I don't no. We're well, just asking to speak to you just, without coming in. I don't, yeah, yeah, you can't too. come so, in. Just ask for a message. I don't, I don't do trance you're not, medium. You're not coming. Your name's not mind. on the door. You're okay. not it's coming really, in. It's the weirdest sensation though because I li- I do channeling of higher um like. Like you only want the higher entities coming like the, in. Only well. the yeah. angelic. Yeah. 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 It's, it's probably yeah. one of your yeah. lot coming with a message to you. It's your mediumship <laughs> lot. It's like all these dead yeah. people coming in. Yeah. I'm, like, well, I'm not a vessel you. for you to use. So, so if you've got yeah, messages. I'm always dying for a chance. I keep hearing this name, Rodney. I don't know if someone's watching and they know a Rodney or they are a Rodney. It's for you, but I'm not. I'm like, it's literally a man's voice. Do you know voice. someone called Rodney that's passed? That person who's just died recently. Who is that? Because that's a man's voice going, Rodney, 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 Rodney. I'll make some inquiries. Very deep voice, Rodney. Hey, Rogers. Makes me think of um, Only Fools and Horses.